community of Houston, Texas. This is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational spiritual community providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress now with Rev. Howard Caesar. So I'm going to begin with a question this morning, and that is, uh, I wonder how many of us here uh, today were, were taught or somehow had conveyed to us a concept of God that, a God that was really to be feared, um, the message that uh, perhaps God was a punishing God, or God was, you know, God giveth and, and the God taketh away, and uh, various ideas, uh, sometimes maybe a message of doom and gloom. You need to be worried, uh, you know, the world could end. And so there are people out there sometimes uh, in various uh, ministries, I guess, through time, uh, periodically somebody would show up and say, oh, the world is going to be coming to an end on such and such a date, and they would predict it from certain p pieces or places of scripture. And uh, of course, then the, the time would come and go, and because uh, we're all here, right? And, uh, and then you have to be suspicious if there is a ministry that is out there and they're talking about predicting the end of the world, uh, yet they have a three-year building program going on. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, there's a lot of that that um, has gone on. And I, I grew up with, you know, kind of the fear of God being put in me, uh, and that was kind of the concept. And so as we grow and mature spiritually, those concepts uh, are meant to change. Uh, they truly are. Sometimes it was very easy to believe in a, a God that was a punishing God or one to fear because uh, we project onto God sort of the parent in the sky and that maybe our parents were ones that paddled us or, or frightened us if we were going to be naughty or bad or something or things would be taken away from us and unconsciously we projected this idea of God being very much parental, uh, which again is not true or accurate, but that's what the mind will often do. And so here at Unity, of course, we teach that uh, fear is to be done away with. Uh, fear stands in the way of really a close uh, relationship, uh, a deep bond with God, and that in order for us to have inner peace and uh, harmony, that we need to really heal our fears. Um, and, and fear needs to be uh, banished or uh, done away with in, in terms of, uh, anyway, in terms of the fear of, of God for sure. And, and, and God is not fear. Uh, really, it's very hard to have a, a close relationship. Um, the Bible talks a lot uh, about fear and the fear of God and uh, that uh, there is a God out there that we are to be afraid of. There's a, a passage in Proverbs uh, 23, you can look it up, it, it states, let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in fear of the Lord all the day long. <laughs> so is that what you want? Uh, <laughs> be in fear of the Lord all the day long. So what I'm here to tell you is that you can't take that literally. And that is not actually what it means uh, by any means. Bible scholars, Bible commentaries will tell you that the use of the word fear uh, is not really accurate, uh, that what was translated into the English language as fear uh, is not necessarily at all close to what the intended meaning was. For the word fear actually was meant to mean and does mean revere. It's not fear, but revere God. So anytime you see a reference to fear the Lord, basic meaning there was intended that you are to revere God. And the dictionary says revere means to regard with respect, to stand in awe of, to honor and to adore. So we're talking about uh, a relationship. And it's very hard to have a relationship with uh, a person or being uh, or the source that we call God, spirit, uh, that we're afraid of. Uh, so we need to get beyond that. The word reverent, uh, reverence, you know, like they put sort of in the front of a minister, reverend. Um, that's supposed to be funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the word re reverence, uh, which is, of course, revere, 
that, that means a feeling, a feeling or an attitude of deep respect mixed in with awe, okay? So we are to have reverence for the divine. We are to revere God, not fear God. And so whenever the Bible is talking about to fear the Lord, um, it's basically, again, back to revering the importance of honoring, adoring, uh, worshiping, standing in awe and wonder of uh, this world that has been created and nature and flowers and sunsets and what have you. you know? So I'd like to look at a little bit for, for time here some of the passages that contain the word fear. And uh, you, you need to understand that even the Bible concordance, which is an assistance uh, to us ministers in looking up Bible scriptures and what have you, and you look under the word fear and it will say that the word fear actually also or was intended to mean revere. Okay, so it's, it's everywhere, really, uh, that understanding. But in 2 Chronicles, the 19th chapter, there is a reference to Jehoshaphat, who is the king of Judah, and the verse states, quote, And he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart. So you're supposed to do something in the fear of the Lord and do it faithfully and with a perfect heart. How can you be in faith when you're in fear? It doesn't even make sense, the sentence that is there. Okay? So some of the Bible passages uh, also refer to the fear of the Lord as where and how you find wisdom. In other words, out of the ability or the tendency to build into your consciousness uh, a reverence for, a revering of, adoring, standing in awe of God, uh, with consistency, you open then to a wisdom. That's how wisdom begins to come in, is out of that relationship of knowing that presence and power is there all the time and you stand in awe of it and your, your heart is looking for and taking your eyes to things that, uh, that adore uh, the, the glory, the goodness of God. And so in Job, this is evident. In Job 28, uh, you have Job talking about or reflecting on the question, actually, where is wisdom found? That's his question. And he says, and where, where is the place of understanding, as though there is a place? And the passage says this, quote, the depth, the depth of us, the depth saith, it is in me. It is in me. And he says, it then goes on to say, it can't be gotten for gold or silver, Golden crystal cannot equal it. Jewels or pearls or coral or rubies of topaz in, of Ethiopia. And he goes on to say, God understands the way to wisdom and understanding, and he knows the place it is. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heaven. Then did he see it and declare it. He prepared it, yes, he searched it out. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So you have that line I'd like to highlight where it says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And what is really being said there, you need to switch out fear and enter, uh, put in its place, uh, revere. To revere God, that is wisdom, okay? And that will bring on wisdom, to have that sense of respect, awe, adoration, uh, to have that de depth of feeling and connectedness. Then there is also references to the idea of the awe, to stand in awe of God, that that is the fear of the Lord, is to stand in awe. <clears throat> and this is pretty well shown in uh, some of the Psalms. Uh, for instance, in Psalm 19, uh, we have it stated, the heavens, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Get the sense of awe there. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That's even, again, another reference to wisdom. The statutes of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. And I love this line. The fear of the Lord is clean, 
enduring forever. All right? So the fear of the Lord is clean. And what do we mean by clean? It really means that basically uh, you are really free of fear, free of guilt, free of shame, free of sadness, free of unforgiveness. You're clean. Okay, and out of that, that, re that revering the Lord, adoring the Lord, having respect for those laws and those principles, uh, integrating them into your life, there is a, a, a purity, there is a, a clearing, there's an illumination, if you will, because once you clear all that, all that shows through any longer is the light that you were created to be, where Jesus said, let your light shine, don't hide it, uh, don't hide it under the covering of all of these false ideas that you have about yourself and about life, uh, you carry with you from the past, all of that type of thing. And so few, if any of us, have really experienced an extended period of that feeling clean, because what happens is our mind comes rushing in and fills it again with more judgments, uh, more commentary about ourselves, about life, and so forth, that is not necessarily accurate and true. And so everything that we think carries an energy with it. And so as we come to know the truth, the truth will set us free. Uh, it'll set us free in terms of being clean and pure because we're aligned with truth. The truth is accurate. It's not false. And, uh, and that's part of our evolution. That's part of our unfoldment as uh, spiritual beings. Proverbs has some additional verses that help, I think, to clarify what the fear of the Lord really is and what, it's, what is really meant by it. So just let me share with you four or five Proverbs. They're always quick, but they have a lot to say. Proverbs 8 states, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverse mouth do I hate. So now if you put in there, to revere to revere God is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverse mouth. Okay, Proverbs 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So, to revere God is the beginning of knowledge. So, if you really don't have a sense of a connectedness to a, a source, to that one spirit that fills all space and time, that is everywhere present, whose nature is love, if you don't engage with that, you're really not going to go, get to the depths of true knowledge and understanding about life and its laws and its universal principles. Proverbs 14 states, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why would want to be in a fountain of fear? It just doesn't make sense, does it? So to revere God is like a fountain of life. Uh, makes sense, doesn't it? Hello? Anybody home? Okay. All right. And the last one, <laughs> um, the last one, Proverbs 15. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. So to revere God is where the beginning of the instruction on what wisdom truly is begins. It's wonderful, isn't it? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Okay, so there you have it. Okay, to revere the Lord. It's not to fear the Lord, it's to revere the Lord. To bring a sense of respect mixed with awe. Uh, it leads to wisdom and understanding. And so awe is a wonderful thing. Uh, awe of uh, perhaps like a sunset. In fact, there's a, um, <clears throat> a, a wonderful story about uh, a guy named John Izzo, and he shares a personal story that he had. He recalls a time when he was in high school, and uh, his grandfather invited him to go on a rowing trip, you know, just in a little boat rowing. They, were, they lived on the, on the shore, uh, or they were staying there or whatever, but uh, his grandfather, who was previously a shipbuilder and loved being out on the water, and um, he was in his 70s, and he had said to John, you know, there's a strong likelihood I can feel that there's going to be a glorious sunset. And so uh, if you're interested, there's a, a, we can row out to this uh, tiny cove, which is beyond uh, a land mass, and it's a beautiful, beautiful setting, and we can watch the sunset there. Well, it was a hot day. It was 95 degrees. And so John, being 15 years old and uh, not wanting to row for an, over an hour to get there, uh, said, another time would be better, Grandpa. Uh, but his grandfather said, ah, 
Another time is for young men. <laughs> Let's do it now. I don't know if he had an, uh, uh, whatever. So anyway, off they went. And uh, it was nonstop rowing for more than an hour, as I say. And because he was 15, his grandfather was along for the ride. And uh, <laughs> so John's task was to row. And the whole trip, his grandfather kept chiding him to go faster. Faster, we got to get there, because they needed to get beyond this landmass into this cute, wonderful cove to be able to see the sunset uh, properly. And so he was going, you know, rowing like crazy, and, and finally they got there around this uh, point. And uh, moments after they got there, the sky burst into this orange and purple blaze. It was just uh, gorgeous. And, and even John remembers to this day the, 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 the beauty, the breathtaking beauty of that scene uh, that he's never forgotten. And he recalls that they were only there a few minutes. And uh, his grandfather said, OK, let's head back now. <laughs> And John couldn't believe it. And so he protested leaving so soon. He, he said, you know, Grandpa, I, I'm dying. I'm just perspiring. I just am exhausted. Uh, and his grandpa said, no, well, they're, they're making dinner. And we, we need to get back for dinner because, you know, we need to be sensitive. They're, they're providing for us. And so let's, let's haul, haul this boat back. And so <laughs> I almost slipped there. <laughs> You caught that, didn't you? <laughs> so they began the journey back. <laughs> and, uh, and John was rowing all the way. And, uh, and he was you know, complaining all the way back. He was saying, you know, that, it was a nice sunset, but, you know, it wasn't worth, it's not worth all this rowing, Grandpa. And uh, the boat, you know, it's old. It has old oars, and it's, it's cranky. And the, the current, you know, is pretty strong today. And uh, it, why, don't, why don't you take a turn and, and row? <laughs> anyway, finally, after about 30 minutes, uh, and as he was rowing, and his grandpa is continuing to gaze at the sunset, you know, because they can last pretty long if they have a lot of clouds there, you know, right? And uh, so finally, after about 30 minutes, his grandpa just turned his gaze away from the sunset and, and looked and stared at John for a moment, and uh, he said, John, uh, put, put the oars down. And so he stopped, and uh, looking John in the face, he said, I want to tell you something today, uh, something I, I very much hope you will remember. He said, John, most of life is rowing. And if you don't learn to be good at it and enjoy it, the rowing, you're going to grow up to be a very unhappy man. Now put your hands back on those oars <laughs> and get me back home for dinner. And so at the time, he thought that was just kind of babble. But he remembered what his uh, grandfather said. And he, he said he, he'd carried them with him uh, all his life. He remembers the, the sunset. And he remembered those words, life is mostly rowing. Because there will be moments of ecstasy, and you know, some people just think it's all sunsets. It's all wonderful and glorious all the time. But there's some work to be done internally in life. And uh, most of life is made up of simpler moments. And yes, there are highlights and high moments and what have you, but you have to realize that a part of life, and a large part of life, is rowing. It's rowing, you know? And it could be the simpler moments like a walk on the beach, it can be, you know, uh, attending a little league game that your son or grandson or granddaughter or whatever uh, might be in. Uh, it can be just a, a good feeling that you helped somebody or you put in a good day's work. You felt productive even though you feel like, uh, you know, you, you spent a good bit of energy. So it's not necessarily always the big things that really determine life. Uh, marriages are not made on the basis of the honeymoon. Uh, parenting is not done on the basis of a camping trip once a year. Uh, most of life is spent rowing, and uh, it's rowing that can life, it, it, it's the rowing that can make your life meaningful. How it is that you deal with the aspect of life that has rowing in it. You know, are we able to revere life 
have a respect for life, uh, love life, adore life, um, look for the good in life, even as we're rowing uh, through some, some tough current, tough current and some difficult times. So what part of rowing do we need to pay more attention to? You know, um, and are we one that tends to be complaining as we're rowing through uh, the challenges of life? You know, when I look at a ministry, um, the ministry is made up of mostly people that are rowing. You know, you may see me here on Sundays and, and Michael and some of the other associates periodically, um, but there are a lot of people rowing. We're more visible, um, but it wouldn't happen without a lot of people uh, doing other things. And, and, and I row, too. My life has some rowing in it, um, believe me. Um, but there is a, a story um, about a, a mother that was taking her children to uh, a restaurant, and she had one of her children was six years old, and, um, and so the six-year-old asked if he could say grace, and she said, sure. And so um, the little boy, six years old, said, God is good, God is great, thank you for this food, and I would even thank you, Mom, if you get us ice cream for dessert, <laughs> and liberty and justice for all, amen. <laughs> well, there were some other customers at nearby tables that heard this, thought it was really cute, and there was some laughter and some giggling, and, uh, but then one lady remarked from one table uh, and said, that's what's wrong with this country. You know, kids today don't even know how to pray. Asking God for ice cream? Why, <laughs> I never. And uh, so hearing this, the little boy heard that and uh, he started crying and said, did I do something wrong? Is God mad at me or whatever? And, and her, his mother held him and assured him that he, he had done a terrific job. And then one gentleman, actually, a stranger, got up, came over to the table, had heard all of that, and uh, approached the table and said, I happen to know that God thought that was a great prayer, said the little boy. And the little boy said, really? And the man said, cross my heart. And uh, then he got close and whispered and said, too bad she never asks God for ice cream. <laughs> a little ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. <laughs> so they went on, they finished their meal, and when the meal was done, the mother, you know, fulfilled the prayer and ordered up some Sundays for her two kids. And when the Sunday arrived in front of this little six-year-old boy, he just stared at it for a few minutes, or for a few moments. And then he went, picked it up, and walked over to where this woman was seated. And with a big smile, he put it in front of her and he told her, here, this is for you. Ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. <laughs> and my soul is good already. So that little boy was learning how to row. He had prayed for an ice cream. That ice cream meant a lot to him. He was looking forward to the ice cream. But when it came time to doing something good for the soul of another person, he picked it up and went and delivered it to this lady. And so there's a lot that we can learn from the children for sure. And sometimes it's being in awe at where God places us to use us in life. And uh, sometimes it's, it's just a, a kindness that we can offer. You know, there was a, an email I got from a lady uh, some years ago, a friend of mine, uh, she, she shared it with myself and a number of other uh, that mutual friends. She had been out that night with a girlfriend the night before, and she had met a, a man, a stranger. Somehow they connected, and, and he had, a, I think, a couple of drinks too many, but he was really feeling uh, bad. And he... Uh, came up to them and said, you know, I'm going to Iraq in two days. And so this was back in that time when um, many uh, servicemen and women were fighting in Iraq, and those who were going were afraid they wouldn't come back. And he said, I'm 47 years old. I'm, uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm a field biologist, and uh, I've just been reactivated. I'm in the Army Reserves, and uh, I'm scared, and I'm lonely. My father just died uh, a few weeks ago, and so death is on my mind. And so... Um, they talked for an hour, and uh, she and her friend, and they let him cry and, and get that out. And she was actually sending out an email that we all pray for that individual, um, that he make it through that time as he rode his way through some tough currents uh, that were ahead for him in his life. But uh, again, she was making the point 
isn't it awesome the way there are no accidents and God brought this stranger into uh, our lives for that brief time and led us to sit down and hear him out and listen to him and let him cry and express what he felt and have a kind of a catharsis so that he could go forward, that somehow uh, she felt that they were really being used by God in that time. And so it's back to, um, you know, if you revere God, then wisdom comes to you in the moment. You know who to be and how to be on a moment-to-moment basis because you are seeing so much of the movement of spirit in your life in so many more ways when you revere God. And so I want you to know as you go forward that it's a way of being, that it is to be in touch with the interior of your life, and uh, it is a, a way to cultivate a feeling of respect and honor and awe uh, for the divine. Uh, you are not here to fear the Lord. You're here to revere the Lord. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. Unity is inclusive, welcoming people of all walks of life in dignity and love. We believe that love, strength, and goodness dwells within you. May we all live in unity with God, humanity, and all of God's creation. And remember, as Reverend Caesar says, life is meant to be good. When you visit Unity of Houston, you'll find a spiritual community, a church where you can connect and learn and grow with a progressive approach to Christianity. At Unity, we welcome you no matter what your beliefs. You'll find a teaching, loving, inspiring experience as we help each other be all we're created to be. Check us out. We'd love to have you. Find us online at unityhouston.org. And remember, life is meant to be good.